So yeah, um, as Matt said, I'm going to be talking about live video at 150 miles an hour. Um, let's quickly do an introduction of who I am and what I do. Uh, I work for Open Broadcast Systems. We specialize in software-based encoders for old-school broadcast. Um, we don't do any web. There's this newfangled thing I've heard called the web. Uh, we don't do that. <laughs> Based in central London. Uh, for the last three years, I've been pointing over there and saying uh, Big Ben is over there, but I can actually not have to do that anymore. Uh, some of you probably have seen my previous talks at DMUX talking about the high-speed electronics we make, high-performance networking. Uh, yeah, you can go find that. Not to be confused with the other OBS key, key point. Right, uh, introduction to onboard racing video. Um, most, of, most people know about the big ticket racing leagues, Formula One, IndyCar, et cetera, et cetera. But as I also learned, um, there's lots of other racing leagues out there, professional leagues to semi-professionals, lot leagues, most are really, really niche. And historically, and to an extent to this day, they're hobbies for people with quite a bit of cash to spare. Uh, what used to be known as gentleman racers, uh, obviously quite different now. They do race at world-class racing tracks, uh, Le Mans, Spa, etc. cetera. Um, and onboard video was first used in the 1980s in Formula One. Um, this is very high-end stuff, uh, license frequencies. They require paperwork, spending a lot of money. There's differences in each country. Uh, it requires engineers who can make sure you're complying with these licenses. Very, very specialist stuff. It's really the, only the top of the top of the racing leagues that can really afford this. Um, so part of what I'm going to try and do is say, how can we actually make this sort of more approachable for other racing leagues? And there are many reasons why you'd want to do this. Um, then some of them are actually quite not very obvious. Uh, broadcast television is the obvious one. Uh, a lot onboard racing video produces some of the most exciting and dramatic footage, I think, of the entire sport. Uh, the teams are really interested in this during the race for strategy. That's not always allowed. Um, lots of these people with cash to spare on a weekend really want to show their friends what they're doing. Uh, friends and family is a surprisingly big driver for this. Do not underestimate this. Uh, and team morale is really important. So in this picture, you can see the team. Some of these guys have worked late into the night um, building these cars, maintaining these cars, and it's really exciting for them to actually see an onboard of the race. Because when you're in the garage, you don't, really get to you don't really get to see much. You just hear the odd whiz of a car now and then. And so they can all be part of the action. It's a really Big deal. Uh, and not all these races are televised either. Um, and operationally, these feeds have various different uses, for example. Sometimes they can see the seat belts loose or something like that. And, and, and this helps a lot with the team strategy. They can watch races uh, afterwards and see what happened. If there was a crash, uh, they can sort of follow up on that. Uh, I want to say, for the teams, uh, it's a little bit different to broadcast. Uh, we actually generate this multi-viewer on the car itself. So front, uh, sorry, driver, front, and rear. Um, I mentioned this because it will be a bit important in a second when we talk about sort of the technical challenges. So yeah, what are the technical challenges? Well, where do we even begin? Uh, you can have a vehicle moving 100, 200 miles an hour. You've got vibrations. You've got heat. You've got a power supply that's dirty. You know, you turn on the engines and the cameras start flickering, for example. You've also actually got historic racing cars, so classic cars, even bigger possibly, even bigger sort of area than sort of quote unquote modern cars, um, they have no power. So this sometimes needs to be battery powered. Um, there is an existing market for sort of portable live video solutions. Um, but racing cars really sort of expose some of the ch technical challenges that these things have. Uh, most of these things have kind of cell phone grade consumer encoders, such as the Umbrella H1. Um, that's not to say it's a bad encoder, but it's designed really to say to, to be low power encoder and really the speed at which the cars go and the generation of that multi-view that has three different screens uh, really stresses this thing. Um, and it really struggles with this. Um, and this, the texture of the road, the trees, ah, it really struggles. Uh, it won't come as a surprise to you we're going to use cellular technology. And unfortunately, people who test these kind of solutions think it's the cellular technology and it's the network that's causing these issues. Uh, some of the solutions of, often also require a person to actually press a start and stop, and the drivers get really upset when you do that. The, some of them have batteries, et cetera, et cetera. And they also have a bunch of other technical issues. Um, they're, they're, one of their sort of unique selling points is adaptive bit rate. So they can get video out from anywhere, crowds of people, a war zone. But this isn't particularly good on a track, because what happens is you have a, a bit of the track where there's a signal dead spot. The encoder drops the bit rate dramatically to compensate, and it takes half a lap to recover, maybe. But then what happens when you go past that same spot again? Well, it drops again. And so practically, you end up with only half the race viewable. 
The other technical challenge is it's really, really difficult to test beforehand. Um, when this project first started, uh, we weren't actually allowed to travel to Belgium, so I actually logged into the car, I SSH'd into a car going around the track and changed the settings whilst it was going around the track uh, in my living room, watching the feed, changing bit rates, changing FEC settings, this, that, and the other. Uh, it also makes uh, the, the word software crash kind of has to, multiple meanings now. Um, <laughs> It, it, it can ha have videos of it happening. Uh, they, they say there was a crash, but what kind of crash do you actually mean? Uh, there's also some sort of bizarre form of continuous integration where you make a change and wait for the driver to go around and then make another change and wait for the driver to go around. And there's some kind of semi-scientific kind of, they're broadly following the same racing line. It's, so yeah, there's some kind of semi-scientific continuous integration going on there. Uh, what operational challenges are there? So there's two main use cases. Um, Sort of the traditional broadcast element um, where you want to really minimize latency, so you want something like, I don't know, sub half a second. But what's notable is you have someone who really understands the workflow at the track. And there's the teams themselves where, at best, you'll have a mechanic who can understand electrics. That's the best you're going to get. So they can fix wires. If there's a, they can fix cabling. They can maybe change SIM cards. But it needs, the engine needs to be turned on, and then some seconds later, you need to have pictures. And you could be in a very remote place, such as a spa in Belgium, as you'll see. It's in the middle of the forest. You have very limited signal. So they can tolerate higher latencies. They can tolerate lower bit rates. Um, the equipment and cabling, it can't disturb any of the operations of the race. Um, this is quite important, for example, when you're cabling. If they need to do an engine change or bodywork change, they can't be messing around with these cables and all this other equipment. Um, they're not going to be very impressed if you ask to change your SIM card during a pit stop. SIM cards are fiddly. They're not going to be at all impressed, or any other gear for that matter. So it needs to just kind of work in that use case. Uh, SIM cards, sorry, I'll show you the other side. SIM cards are a complete nightmare. Um, they're a nightmare to buy in many countries. You need that said country's ID card. For some reason in the UK, it seems to be very simple, but in mainland Europe, in France, and the US, it seems to be even more complicated. You need to have a, a modem certified by the provider. So I've had, actually had to buy a bunch of American modems just so I have the right code to be able to buy a SIM, just to show it to them, and then I can take the SIM and put it, actually put it in the car. And it seems telecom providers are so reluctant to sell you large amounts of data, it's astonishingly complex, because some of these races are eight hours or 24 hours long. Like, we can't change the SIM cards. We need to buy as much, you know, hundreds of gigabytes of data sometimes. So yeah, uh, encoding at 150 miles an hour. Um, I'm not the expert on cameras. I uh, can talk to uh, me a bit afterwards about that. But there are various types of small cameras optimized for all sorts of applications. You can shade them. You can do all sorts of things, build mounts. Uh, and as I mentioned, the multi-view is generated in the car itself. So we, at the moment, send one feedback with all, all of these uh, three screens. If it's a broadcast, we'll actually change the screen uh, during the race. And we chose the Intel NUC, because uh, what we make. but Notably, it has 12 volt input. It's low cost. Uh, if there's a crash, um, you can just replace it. Uh, current chip shortage, it's quite useful. You can just find them anywhere. Um, what's, the other interesting thing is uh, sound. I never really thought about this, but like, if you watch it without any sound, it's really weird. Like, it's just really disconcerting. So um, we actually spent quite a bit of time putting microphones in the car just to hear the room room sound, but it psychologically makes it so much better. <laughs> I cannot. It's very strange. Um, so yeah, for the broadcast use case, we use a low latency H.264 intro refresh. So at best, for 50 milliseconds to encode, I don't know, 50 to 100 milliseconds to decode, and maybe, well, I'll talk about this a bit later. Over 5G, we could maybe do 250 milliseconds transport delay, something like that. But for the other sort of um, sort of self, I don't know, bring it for the sort of uh, team-operated system, it's longer got two or three seconds, maybe two, three megabits. That'll kind of work anywhere. They just turn it on, it'll work. So let's just look a bit how uh, this is mounted. Um, so in this car, there isn't much space, so it's actually mounted behind the driver. Um, quite a big mess of uh, cables, specialist cables as well, actually, for that matter. So it's mounted in like an A pillar. So the bottom is the multi-view, the middle is the encoder, and the top is the audio embedder. And as I'll talk about later, these have some experimental 5G modems in them. Uh, base stations are really important to look at. Uh, running out of time, but France is really useful. It get, they show you where all the base stations are. Notably, not all the operators cover a single tra uh, all the track, uh, especially the pit, the pit lane where you're covered with concrete on both sides. That's a real nightmare. So you can't depend on a single operator because coverage varies. And so you need a protocol that's capable of using both connections at the same time and weighting them as strength increases. 
Uh, as far as I know, I might be wrong, but there's no consumer, mass market consumer protocol that can do any of this. So we ended up choosing Zixi and AWS Media Connect. It's very low cost. It's pay as you go. I think it's like 10 cents an hour or something. So the encoder on board the car connects to both base stations, goes into, goes into the cloud where it's debonded, and then at least the team in the garage can watch it. And then the web stack, um, we use again the AWS stack. So that goes AWS Media Connect uh, into Media Live. Uh, Media Live, I think, supports some kind of HTTP overlay. So they use the API from the track to show, uh, well, this is a demo one, but they will, it will show the position and what's going on. And then they do HLS delivery, I think, the media package to non-broadcast, uh, sorry, non-broadcast devices. Uh, 5G is really interesting. Um, lots of tracks now have public 5G available. Uh, you can get really low latencies, you know, pings at 20 to 30 milliseconds. And we've done, I think, 20 megabits per car quite easily. But modems are really, really immature. They're not designed for eight hours of continuous UDP traffic. They get really hot. There's a bunch of power issues which means we had to plug them into the NUC at the time. Fake 5G, I could talk about fake 5G for ages. That, that, that logo you see on your phone, like not, most of the time it's complete nonsense. Um, private 5G is really interesting. Um, we actually used this at the Queen's funeral for the first time. Um, I wasn't really sure I was allowed to talk about that. But you can basically bring your own base station, have hundreds of megabits available to you that belongs to you, and no one else can interfere. A bit more challenging on the track. Uh, multiple base stations are needed. The other question is, we can, we can sometimes have hundreds of cars on the track. Uh, can we actually do this? Probably be on the grid line with beam forming when uh, you have big challenges. So yeah, I've done this on a technical level, but I'm not going to go to the track every weekend. Uh, please, someone take this idea and run with it, because like, if you're the kind of person that wants to be on a track every weekend, like this is for you. Uh, this is Eau Rouge Radion, probably the most stunning and terrifying corner you will ever see. Pictures don't do it justice. I don't know how people drive this, drive this corner. And uh, quick thanks to Jean-Luc Dubois. He let us mess about in all his cars, put all this gear in, and he took a serious interest in what we're doing. So being a um, team principal of a racing, a racing team is a really difficult job, much harder than sort of running any other company for reasons I uh, will ex could probably explain afterwards. It's a, and he spent serious time. He's got a million other things to deal with, gearboxes, engines, this, that, the other, finances, commercials. But he spent a lot of time helping us, making sure we could get things in his cars, and the mechanics rules are very helpful. And also to Xavier for... Uh, Introducing us to racing and his expertise in cameras. Done.